Well, hey, I'm excited to be here today with Ryan Dahl from Praise Charts. Ryan, it has been a while. It is great to see you. So great to see you too. Yes, I remember being in the great land of the liberties. Yes. How many liberties there are? I don't know, but uh, what a great college and a great environment, great part of the country. So nice to see you again. It is very good to see you. And we were just chatting a few minutes before how you, you got like the prime setup. It just looks like you're in master control there. Yeah, master control. It's like central command. You know, I control all the songs that every church <laughs> sings across North America from my little <laughs> podcast studio here. No, nothing Love like it. that. But uh, I do like tech. I like music. I like worship, but I love design and, you know, nice video, nice yeah. layout, nice lighting. And so I've taken a little time to you're you killing know, it. You're making me that. feel self-conscious about yeah. the nothing I have behind me. That's all right. Oh yeah, blank ba background. That that'll work. But well, I'll no, tell you something. It. Here's here's a good principle of good design: is you okay. need to have contrast, right? Yeah. So you have like a really good background and then like a white background, and so the two of us we look really good together. Awesome. So. Do I get partial points because I wore a black T-shirt today? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Did, there I don't you know go. if you can see this. This is my no more celebrity <laughs> pastors. T shirt. Okay. <laughs> my little my little t shirt. I had a book Love it. Made. Love it. That's hilarious. Well, Ryan, I've been doing this series called Worship Architects, and most of the time I'm talking to worship leaders and the people that are up front. But mm -hmm. I wanted to chat with you just because mm. you are a worship architect and you've really been resourcing <laughs> the church for man, 20, 25 years behind the yeah. scenes. And like Praise Charts has been a leader in resourcing the church with digital music and before that yeah. sheet music and charts for well over 20 years. Can you tell us uh, the story of how you saw that unmet need and how you stepped out in faith mm -hmm. to meet it all those years yeah. ago? Well, uh, just to tell you, like, I am so, I don't come from the world of big stage, big lights, smoke, lasers, moving things. I, I think that whole world skipped me by. I come from the world of smoking soundboards and setting up chairs and the lights consist of fluorescent lights that take about half Ooh. an hour to actually, you know, power Turn up. on. Yeah. And oh yeah. And then when they go down, I've been in services before where those fluorescent lights go down, and then it's like, oh no, what are we gonna do now? So, so much of my early days is so low tech. It's so not even, you know, this little office that I'm in right now. So. Uh, it's so funny. Maybe. I, I, I forgot yeah. about I forgot about the gym lights that take forever. Like we're both from Canada, so I remember yeah. like going to school and like, oh, it's it's gym period, and we had yeah. like while we were getting changed, the the teacher had to put that funky key in that weird yeah. keyhole and on go the lights, and they took yeah. like five ten minutes just to warm up and turn on. Totally, totally. So I remember that world. Funny anyway. funny story just about that is sure. this literally this last week I led worship at the church where I started praise charts out of. No and I, I led worship not in the main center. Now they've built a beautiful building, but they have satellite campuses. And one of them's in a gym in this little community about five minutes from the main hub. And so there I am, 25 years later, back in a gym, the same old church. I even opened my worship set telling the story. It's like I'm getting a whole bunch of uh, flooded of early wow. memories of this all is how it all started and uh, and so i sort of share that is because like the early days of when praise chart started really comes from just a guy in a church with a smoke and sound board that was one story i have and and you know terrible lights and things like that trying to make something of this world and and sheet music i mean we were writing out chord charts on napkins on pieces of paper here and then i wanted to bring in a little mini orchestra into our church stage, which consisted of like a tuba and an oboe and a trumpet and an acoustic guitar. It was like, it was that hodgepodge, right? But Uncle Ryan's the, jug uh, band. I exactly, love it. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but the game changer for me, and this kind of talks about the heart of praise charts, is mm. at the end of some of those services where we had the most contorted band you can imagine. I had moms and dads coming up to me after the service and saying, I just want you to know the difference you're making in my son's life. Mm -hmm. He's like 16 years old, barely fits in at school, plays wow. trumpet, and now he has a place to belong and play. Who else gives him a spot to play? I love that. So I that's that. kind of like the heartbeat. Even here we are 25 years later, and I still am like, the reason I love orchestrations 
in particular is because it's 40 more seats for someone to play something. So it's not really about sounding like the album. And I know we all like to sound awesome and got multi tracks and many things to help us with that. But I'm trying to create seats for someone to get on stage. Yeah. And now we're really big into, you know, choral music. Again, the same heartbeat is if you have a choir, now you got 60 more places for someone to to get a invitation via planning center, which would be an honor for some people to go, I'm like on the team. Yeah. They invited me, right? Yeah. And so I feel like Praise Charts is just a bit of a conduit for for meaningful engagement beyond just, you know, yeah. singing in the congregation, which is great too. But it's nice to be connected and involved. And yeah, uh, I like that too. I mean, I'm just, I'm starting to get now all these little invitations, different places through Planning Center. I love getting Planning Center invites because I'm like, they want me, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I get part to of the play. Team. I'm a part of the team. Uh, that's the feeling that I I have. And, uh, and then I'm going into praise charts myself and, you know, making arrangements and tweaking. I'm fixing broken chords, all that kind of stuff. So Man. same old world. So how did it all begin? <laughs> What what, yeah. what what did you see? What did you see that wasn't being met at the time? And, and yeah. what made you think, huh, I'm going to start this thing? Yeah, I was going to show you. I'll show you this. Right now, I have a company called Sunrain Media, which is like the overarching company of praise charts. But that all came from this songbook, which I made when I was 19 years old. It's got like 250 chord charts in it. You see that? I made like about... 200 copies of that songbook for my church and a few other camps and churches around um, Canada, just because I wanted to get the music out. I mean, this has stuff oh. like, I love you, Lord, and open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I, I mean, Hillsong was barely a thing when this songbook came out. So I collected a bunch of songs together, had no concept of trying to make a business of it. I just wanted to resource churches and sure i think that sometimes in business businesses if you call praise charts a business can be most effective when they start from that authentic place where someone wasn't just trying to make money they were actually mm -hmm. trying to do something that they probably would have done for free anyways and so i was doing this back mm -hmm. in 19 this the copyright line on this little book here is 1993. So that's almost 30 years ago. Wow. And it took me five years until I had a band. I had musicians. They didn't have music. I wanted to sing Shout to the Lord and Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord, and some Dennis Jernigan songs I was really into. It's like, where do we get the music for this? And um, no one was keeping up with the music industry. It's like the music industry was stuck in the the print machine that was always six months behind. And I wanted to be like flowing like a river every week. New music, you know, is being written. Do you remember the days? I mean, you're a Canadian, you know, Brian Dirksen and yeah. like Vineyard Canada and yeah. uh, all that kind of stuff. Come now is the time to worship uh, Refiner's songs. Fire. Yeah. These are like the early songs that seem to bring this fresh sound this acoustic guitar kind of led worship intimate connection that was all happening in a new way in the in the late 90s which is the the founding year of praise church really it was just a little sole proprietor enterprise me and maybe half of another person's you know time it was 1998 which puts me in the 25th year uh today wow Kind of well, crazy. Happy twenty fifth <laughs> anniversary. And there there was some other kind of invention that happened in the in the nineties that was probably really important to the success yeah, of praise. The, some, some, the, the interwebs <laughs> kind of came right. into being in, yeah. in the nineteen nineties. And so you were just uh you know, you think about the sovereignty of God and when he decided for you to be born yeah. and, and what he put inside of your heart. And yeah. it's like all of this kind of coming into play at the at the right time so that you yeah. could resource people and i was yeah. even thinking about just how novel like even before the internet how novel an overhead projector is because before overhead projectors you'd ha you'd have to wait until a hymnal was published you'd mm -hmm. have to wait until a songbook was published mm -hmm. to have the lyrics accessible and then overhead projectors is just like instantaneously you can put words in front of people or chords yep. in front of people and then yep. of course with the internet everything goes digital yep 
unbelievable. It's, uh, I love how Elevation Worship a couple albums ago, you know, they yeah. had the overhead projector. Yeah, ultra. Because there's something about those of us who were like mid 20s back in the 90s have grown yeah. up and now become like, you know, adults through through the last 25 years. But we have this fondness. And the guys at Elevation, there's even a song that talks about, you know, the songs that actually meant something. And we were all just playing guitars and we weren't thinking about getting publishing contracts or whatever. And, it, you know, the song, I can't remember what it's called, but it's got like little lyrics of shout to the Lord and things like that. Yeah, no, I know it. exactly so, the song you're, you're, yeah. you're thinking about. I forget the name of it as well, but it, Me too. You, yeah. you know, it brings it, I remember like being a kid and it wouldn't be uncommon to see on a chorus like even like creating me a clean heart oh, yeah God. it would say author unknown and and <laughs> and isn't it weird yes. we've gone from author unknown to like yeah. a featuring credit for like oh yeah every, yeah you know funny but not funny right it's totally. just like it's become it's become an industry well i got a question yeah. for you here as you right. observed worship leaders come and go over the past 20 years because you've seen people seasons right yeah yeah what do you think contributes to longevity in ministry and are there any worship artists who were around when you started praise charts mm -hmm. who continue to have the same impact in the marketplace today mm. well i can't okay the one guy i think who has been the long he's like the grandfather who still seems like a young guy is paul balash i mean he seems Agreed. like he's everybody's friend i feel like he's one of my second best friends you know i could call up Paul, and he would just answer my text and be like, hey, Ryan, come on over, you know, kind of thing. But then I discover he's everybody's best friend. So there you go. And maybe and that's he, part of the secret to longevity, like being a nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he's got such a, a father's heart, an uncle's mm -hmm. heart, just kind of the way he talks, the way he leads. He's obviously written huge, massive songs, yeah. mostly in his earlier days, but He's still living in his apartment in New York and still putting out songs, still doing the work. He's like, he's the working worship leader who he yeah. isn't like, you know, I wrote the great song. I'm just going to live off of that. Yeah. He just keeps going. And so uh, I always feel built up, always feel encouraged. I've done numerous interviews with him, just like yeah. what we're doing like this. They get some of the best response because people listen to him and feel like, they're talking to someone who's giving them the goods, like mm. the real goods of yeah. character and uh, and musicianship. You know, here's how you play this chord, and then here's how you can be a great guy who plays the great chord. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, he that's what you get out it of Paul. He, it's not just yeah. like a musician. It's not just a songwriter. It's not just a worship leader. It's kind of like the trifecta of all three. Yeah, yeah, and I definitely remember Paul has been there all through the years of praise charts, meaning his songs, you know, right. from open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I can't remember what would have been before then. Um, God maybe, of wonders. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, he didn't he, write that, but um, I love to be in your presence, presence with, with your, your people, people yeah. singing praise. Oh that's, yeah. That's, that's totally. an early Paul song. Yeah. So, so, okay. So we got Paul that's been around for a while. What do you think it is that contributes to longevity in ministry other than being just a nice guy? Like what, Yeah. as you, as you think about like the, even your friends in Canada who maybe have never had a ministry platform the size yeah. of Paul, but have been faithfully serving in the church for 20 or 30 years. What is it? Why yeah. do they stick around? Why do they stay in the ministry? Cause a lot of people yeah. fall and come and go. Yeah. I think to be interesting enough, it's kind of the same reason I'm still doing praise charts. 25 years later, when mm -hmm. so many companies have come and gone is because I didn't get into it like for the money or for the prestige of it. I, there was something more core driving in my spirit that wanted to do it regardless of the opportunity of it. The problem now is that we live in a, uh, a worship world where it's like the opportunity is flashing and that can be attractive. And then people don't last because they were somehow maybe more attracted to the opportunity than there was something real authentic going on. And I, I'd want to be careful not to sound too judgmental of, of anyone because I like opportunity just like the next person, you know? Mm -hmm. But you take a someone like a Paul or a Brian Dirksen was another name, you know, of, of a guy that's just been there for such a long time. And I know they have stories. Like Paul's story was he was not the headline 
musician. It was his right. wife, Rita Belash, yeah. was writing yeah. songs like, I will celebrate, sing unto the Lord, sing to the Lord, you know, songs yeah. like that. He was just Rita's guitar player. And then he sort of got discovered in like, Paul, you've got something. You should right. should do something with this. Right. Um, so, you know, you can't beat authenticity as far as a a principle of lasting for the for the long haul is are you in it for the right reasons and even if you do layer on money so even to be totally honest i'm sure paul has made lots of money from open the eyes of my heart work right mm -hmm. but that didn't somehow ruin him or distract sure. him from he's written giant songs same with brian dirksen or whatever he's got yeah four or five songs in the top 100 but you still go to his house i was at his house for a family dinner just uh i don't know within the last year and it's like this is just regular old family right uh he's still a dad at heart he's kind of quirky you know he still has this little library and his kind of old couch that he likes to sit in and and so people that have that kind of raw realness to them it's like i feel like are gonna yeah right it's it like keeps you keeps you amongst the people and yep. uh it, it's really interesting you talk to anybody like paul or brian and you talk to them about how they got into worship leading and it's very rarely is it a flashy story at yeah. all it's just totally. like there, there was a need it honestly like most stories are there was a need and i wanted to serve the need and mm -hmm. sometimes it was very lackluster it was just like i was setting yep. up chairs in a gym you know kind of going back to what you're saying, waiting for the gym lights to turn on. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, hey, tell totally. us about, um, tell us about the life cycle of a song. Cause you see this a lot in praise charts. You see song, you know, we got the CCLI charts, yeah. but I know you have your own charts as well. <laughs> kind of up and down, up and down. Um, yeah. As someone who's, you know, whose business is platforming songs, what are some things um, in what, pardon me, what are some things inspiring worship songwriters ought to know if they want to write a song that will be sung by the masses 30 yeah. years from now not just right. today but 30 years from now yeah well uh unfortunately or fortunately depends how you look on it the the reality is there's a lot of quote-unquote competition there's a lot of songs being written and maybe right. it's like there's the same number of songs being written but now the platforms allow so many songs to be accessible and heard and things like that so sure. maybe i would just say at the outset have a realistic outlook that more than likely sorry to be depressing but more than likely you're going to write a song that isn't going to be sung for the next 30 years and all around the world and i hope that doesn't dissuade you it's even matt redman chris domlin um keith getty all these people have written so many songs that have never seen the light of day so let's mm -hmm. just kind of remember that sure um Another thing I find interesting, I, I see this in praise charts, is uh, we're in a season where some people feel overwhelmed by there's so much new music. I just want to sing something more familiar, some more anchoring. Yep. And uh, we are finding in praise charts, when I look at the top songs that sold yesterday, so many of them are songs that were written a year, two years, five years, and even 10 years ago not to mention all the hymns that still continue to sell so mm. praise charts doesn't reflect i know we make it look like you come to praise charts and of course we're we're showcasing all this new music but the reality the meat and potatoes of what sells mm -hmm. meaning what people are downloading is they want anchoring songs that have tried the, the you know been through the test of time or or whatever like that sure. so um that's just kind of an, another realistic outlook uh another thing i would say this is a little window into praise charts is we love to have the charts on new music friday like when cody carnes is releasing his album today as we're recording this i think yeah. the whole album yeah and it's like praise charts has all the charts but secretly between you and me they're not actually selling that great on the friday people aren't flocking to it going i gotta buy all the latest and greatest sure. it's it takes time even for the greats of tomlin and cody carnes and elevation even elevation album will have it launched on friday 
people aren't eating it up on Friday. It's going to take time for people need to like hear the song, feel it out. They've got to like discover it. Oh, that song is going to make sense. And sometimes that can take weeks or months or even years before maybe they experience it at a conference. Right. And they go, wow, that was, that was amazing. I didn't even realize about that song. So we find the life cycle is interesting. Usually we'll ramp up. If it's a great song, we'll ramp up over year one. And then it's kind of got a, like a little about like a seven year tail till it falls off. Most songs are like this in praise charts. And then it goes into what you call that long tail. Even Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord, is an example of a song that's just been steady Eddie for the last 25 years. Hasn't been the latest and greatest, but it continues to serve. Mm. It's a go-to, right? Most people have the charts, so it's not going to rank high in, in praise charts. But um, yeah, so that's a few, a little bit of feedback there about having a realistic outlook as to yeah. whether your song's going to go worldwide and understanding the value of tried and true songs as well so what trends yeah. have you observed in how the global church worships what types of needs in the church music marketplace existed 20 years ago that praise charts continues to meet today yeah well i mean it goes without saying people still need charts still need sheet music you know a good old piece of paper people are still printing out music now nowadays it's a lot more ipads and uh, fortunately the these apps are making it quite easy and accessible but the to, to have the music in front of you now i carry an ipad wherever i go and, and i love that mm -hmm. but still it's like notes on a page is not going away because it's the the doorway for a musician to grasp some of the meaningful details of the song. Um, an interesting little uh, thing that I'm I'm always trying to teach and prod people towards is having less dependence on sheet music when they're actually leading worship. So seeing music and charts as the, something to practice with mm -hmm. and to you know get with when you're by yourself in your studio or on Wednesday night, but hopefully as you move towards Sunday. There's a greater, a lesser of a dependence on that music. So you don't have music stands like in front of you and pages falling off and eyes that are directed down. You know, we, you want to lift your head. You're looking at people, engaging, thinking about people as you're leading worship. Even if you're a musician, like even if you're a bass player, how great it is that you look like when you're playing and you could just tell you guys just finding the groove in his heart and soul. And he's really locking into that song versus like head down, you know, just following every kind of note. So sure. yeah, people need to see, so there's a, to see your engagement and to see yeah. you singing even, even if you don't have a mic in front of you, like all exactly. of that is part of yeah. leading worship. Yeah. So there is that kind of like need for music. And then there is a need to prod people beyond music. And Travis, I, I know you're a great musician, as well but i i'm wanting i'm actually going to chicago next week and teaching some sessions trying to help people understand some of the the musicality behind these songs so we understand what does a one four five six mean like yeah. if i say that how many of your listeners immediately are like oh i know exactly what that is but if you don't you really need to know yeah uh, if i say system. one six five sus four and you don't know what that is you're missing out on a whole layer of music that goes yeah. beyond the sheet music. You know what I'm talking about, yeah. Travis? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Nashville number system because you can transpose yeah. on the spot and yep. uh, you know you can just memorize things very quickly and you can chart things out very quickly too, even as you yep. hear them. But yeah, yep. all any type of ear training. I you know I went to school for that, but any type of ear yep. training that that people can do. There's a great apps you can download on your phone now, but just you know, working away at your excellence in your musicianship goes a yeah. long way in serving. Yeah, yeah, church. for sure. It's so good. Hey, I got to talk about the fact that we're both Canadian boys because this is yeah. awesome. You're, you're West Coast. <laughs> I'm in what the West Coast people call Ontario, also known as Ontario. <laughs> and um, I'm just curious to know the praise and worship movement in Canada has its own story. You know this. I know this. Yeah. So what are some Canadian songs? And you mentioned one already and Canadian worship leaders who hail from the great white north that have had an impact yeah. 
both in their native land and throughout the world. Yeah, well, uh, certainly one that we kind of hinted at before is uh, is Brian Dirksen for sure, which is local to me here. He's not as big of a like he's not writing new songs that are really being taken on taken on by the world, but he's got these core four or five songs like the Come Now is the Time to Worship and yeah. um, Refiner's Fire that yeah. that continue to stay. I can't believe that he has four or five songs in the CCLI top 100. It just blows my mind that a yeah. person could write that quality of songs. And mm. they're known and sung all over the world. And it's just a guy in a little house here, 20 minutes from my house, on an acoustic guitar yeah. who's, you know, who's been doing it for the long haul. So, so he's a name for sure. Uh, a couple others, some of them have, you know, started in Canada, but then mm -hmm. transported to the U.S. So uh, Matt Marr is one. I don't even know if we think of him as a Canadian, but I apparently he's he was from Canadian. Canada. No so, way. Yeah, Had there no you idea go. he was Canadian. Yeah. Learned something and new. Wow. He's got brand new music coming out right now. I'm loving some of his songs. Like he's got a new version of Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Let me tell you, people, you got to check this out. It's really great and then another one on the lord's prayer our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name if you want to sing a great you know because because matt's always he's immersed in the whole catholic world mm -hmm. which um by the way i have heard him say if you ever wonder like why is matt a catholic and mm -hmm. it's because he wants to reach those people that's why mm -hmm. he's staying there is mm -hmm. to bring the gospel to this great you know collection of people and he's really authentic to that and brings real good depth to his his worship. And he's got groove. I mean, that guy knows how to sink into the pocket yeah. of, don't you think? I just, yeah, I I agree. just really like his stuff. Man, okay, so these new arrangements, um, yeah. leaning on the everlasting arms and also mm -hmm. the Lord's Prayer. Can people go to praysearch.com and yeah, find those arrangements? absolutely. There? Oh, yeah. There'll That's be awesome. like, they're in the top, top new songs. On the homepage, you will go there right now and you can see... I love Matt Mars. So, I so definitely check that out. His new album, and then uh, a couple others. Amanda Cook. She yeah, uh, okay. she started Winnipeg, went over to Bethel. Now she's working with I don't even know where she landed, but a beautiful, sweet spirit of a girl. Amazing, powerful voice, and uh, I feel like also a very broken spirit too mm -hmm. in a in a positive way like i know she's been through stuff you know mm -hmm. she her marriage broke down i don't think that's a a secret but that rips a person up sure. when that happens and you're in the public eye and she's had to like walk that mm -hmm. journey out um i did an interview with her once on instagram and mm -hmm. i just felt like i could talk to her for an hour we kind of connected at a level of you know, some family background history that we have. And I was like, wow, you are the real thing. So really Authentic like her. Authenticity always mm -hmm. is the, uh, really always connects. the day. Wow. Well, hey, yeah. there's there's a lot that's changed in worship leading over the past 20 years that you've probably yeah. had a front row seat to. Technological advances, complexity in song form. Like even as yeah. I listen to how songs are sung, you know, we've added pre-chorus two and uh, bridge <laughs> yes. bridge five. And yeah. okay, sure, whatever. <laughs> uh, arrangements. Uh, what are some of the things that have stayed the same in worship leading? And why do you mm. think they've stayed the same? Hmm. Oh, just kind of thinking off the cuff. The the first thing that I, I just think of is the acoustic guitar has been uh, a constant. It's it's yeah. interesting how the acoustic guitar is like this instrument that somehow brings the intimacy of a living room onto a big open stage. Uh, it's funny, I was just talking with a Young Buck worship leader last week and he's like, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't like acoustic guitars. They're so lame. You know, I'm, he's all into like just electric guitar only. <laughs> I was like, I really like the acoustic. Somehow it makes me feel just a little more raw, even authentic. As uh, I'm always attracted to when I listen to a guy leading and playing, I am attracted to that sweet blend of how they're acoustic sounds with their voice and and the rhythm that they play so 
So that's uh, that's definitely a thought that kind of comes to mind. I don't know. I might need your help with this one. Like, do you have any thoughts as to... Man, I don't know. Like, that is a really interesting thought because that is true. Acoustic. And I remember there was kind of a shift out of the 80s, like Tom Brooks and Integrity Music was so keyboard driven. And yeah. he kind of, I, I joke with Tom, I'm like, Tom, the reason you might be the reason why we don't do key changes in worship music anymore. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> those, right. Those early in oh, yeah, records. Totally. But Tom, if you're listening to this, I think they're great. They're fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, acoustic guitar would be one of them. I, I think some things that just don't change are like learning to be authentic. Some of the things that we yeah, talked about right. already, being conversational, yeah. being, yeah. I, I tell my, the worship leaders that I lead, your availability is your ministry. Yeah. Very so good. Something I tell people all the time is like the greatest worship leading you will ever do is not on stage with a hand on an instrument, but yeah. off stage with a hand on a shoulder. Yeah. Because because I, I think the people have to matter more than the ministry, and that's never yeah. going to go away. And the people that are here for a short season or that don't have longevity, I think, are the people that frankly don't get that. Mm -hmm. um, but you gotta you gotta be in it for the people. Don't. Go, okay, I so I gotta I got nope. a little. Don't go into ministry and tell people unless you yeah, have people. Yeah, I have a, a very practical expression of that that I want to give out to you because I've heard some worship pastors out there that feel frustrated. They're in the world of planning center, trying to sure. plan, you know, dealing with 40, 50 volunteers, and they send out sure. all these invitations, and nobody responds back. And then it's like they don't know what's happening. Sure. So my little tip for you is if you get an invite through planning center or something else, like respond back, even if it's a no. And when it's a no, say, hey, I can't because, you know, it's my daughter's birthday or something. Like just be a human being yes. through these technological devices and let your worship leader know mm. they matter. You appreciate the invitation. Take it as an honor. Like we opened this conversation to, um, yeah. it's an honor to be invited to the stage so treat it with that kind of honor even through the app uh because there's a human being in behind that app right <laughs> that is a good word ryan that is a great yeah. word so every every uh interview needs a serious question so here's my serious question now as a guy uh that's that's spent his career both leading worship but also resourcing worship leaders what are some of the hardest lessons you've had to learn in worship ministry and how did you overcome them? Mm. Well, I definitely have memories of feeling deeply overwhelmed and uh, terrified mm. at times when I didn't want to be on stage, didn't feel worthy to be on stage. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had times, as aside from worship leading, I have one super humbling experience where I was invited to give a uh, to speak in front of a whole bunch of major music publishers and 10 minutes into my talk, my, my mind froze. I couldn't mm. put words together. I literally, I didn't escape it. I had to bring somebody else up on stage to, to prompt me. I just, I was staring at this spotlight. I was like, I can't think right now. I don't know why. Wow. Can you imagine doing that like Man. on the stage? Ugh. And um, so those are, they're very humbling experiences to have. Even no today, I'm going next week to speak and lead worship at a conference. And it's like, I I know there's the potential that I could do something and it's not going to go awesome. <laughs> like, and how will I handle that? Well, I don't know. Um, I'm just aware of that. I've got other experiences where I, I remember in pre-Easter, just feeling the stress of so many details and trying to please all these people. And it was weight was burning down on me. And I just got on the floor, literally under my desk, nose on the ground saying, mm. God, take me out of this. Like, I, yeah. I can't do this. So, um, so those are some of the the hard pressed realities that I've been through, they, I have those experiences. Maybe you've got, you know, whoever you are listening, you've got experiences as well. And I hope mm. that we need to like share these things with each other and remind each other, you know, it doesn't always go perfect for me. Uh, like no. I shared that experience of being frozen on the stage. My brother 
is in a, in a totally another business. He used to go around and speak to like hundreds or thousands, even in stadiums, he would speak at times mm -hmm. doing his testimony and stuff. And, and he was saying that, that he once froze on stage. So maybe it's like a genetic thing, but just when I heard that, I was like, Oh, that makes me feel so much better that Boy, I'm do not I have the a only... story for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then, you know, he talked about how he had to, like, somehow get the audience to help him get out of the little mental funk that he was in. I have uh, constant nightmares of showing up on stage when I'm supposed to lead worship and having had prepared no songs and having not knowing anything to say so it's just like a nightmare that i feel in my spirit like i'm gonna show up on stage and not have anything to say and no songs and not know how to play anything it's just those are fears that kind of go on inside of me so yeah well and hey it's spiritual warfare is a real thing when you're leading worship. Yeah. you're doing you got a target on your back and you're you're out in the front leading the group and man we all have those funny things i i've said yeah. so many stupid things i've stumbled over my words so yeah. back in the day when we used to we used to pass the offering plates during the offertory, there was one service in my early twenties, and I said, "All right, it's time to pass the money bags." <laughs> <laughs> money bags? What the heck? There's yeah. another There's another time where I think I got caught like, um, mi you know, mid mid belcher. I had to like swallow something while I was saying something. Whatever came out of me, it sound, it ended up like. I'm so glad you've come to worship us this morning instead oh. of with us. <laughs> oh, and right. Yeah. <laughs> so there's like a burp in between there. So like, and, and that was just, yeah. you know, a funny, even before we had like worship fail Instagram accounts, yeah. these would be the things that you'd walk into at a staff meeting and they'd have it all queued yeah. up for you, for you to be completely embarrassed in front yeah. of the entire staff. But, but I do think sometimes the Lord allows us to have those moments to keep us yeah. humble. Yeah. And you were asking, like, how did you get through it? Uh, or how do you get through some of these hard yeah. lessons? And I just would say, for me, and I just want to say this to anyone listening, don't make it like you've got everything all together. Don't pretend, That's don't right. tell stories like your life is going so amazing yeah. all the time. It gets exhausting. And yeah. uh, certainly social media is the powerhouse of my life is amazing. And I'm not saying post your worst stories all on, you know, whatever. Sure. Don't be a, a sour puss, but be real. And, you know, let people know you've got your flaws. Yeah, We need more of that kind of dialogue, right? It's, uh, it's more authentic. Do you ever read anything by the leadership uh, teacher, Patrick Lencioni? No, no. So he's got, um, he's got a great book. You should check it out called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. The five oh, yeah. dysfunctions okay. of a team. And it's written as a parable. The actual meat and potatoes of the whole thing is only a small little chapter at the very end, but the whole front end is, is a parable. And you, you know, the parable very quickly becomes obvious what he's the points he's trying to make. But one of the things that Patrick says when he teaches on leadership is he's like, you know, we all grew grew up with people telling us, don't let them see you when you sweat, when actually you should lift up your arm and be like, Look, I'm sweating. Yeah, I need your I know. help. You know, I I'm know. human like the rest of you. Because I think I think what that does is that it opens up um, a dialogue, it opens up conversation, and it, it like who wants to follow a leader that's held to a standard that they can't up, uphold? Now, don't, mm -hmm. don't hear me wrong, leaders need to have standards, but what mm -hmm. I'm saying is that we're all human and we all need that there's been no provision made for us to live the Christian life apart from the Holy Spirit, and we are going to, we're going to fail this side mm -hmm. of heaven, it's just how it mm -hmm. is. And so to lead in a way that we can, as John Maxwell would say, fail forward and, and to do it in a safe place, I think so much of doing that as a leader is just, uh, I, I tell people, I tell my worship leaders all the time, like some of the most important words that your team can hear out of your mouth is I was wrong. Please right. forgive me. I'm yeah, sorry. I didn't good. have that right. Can you help me? Because yeah. that just brings a humanity to the to something. And you mm -hmm. know what? You, you end up gaining influence in, in the end in their lives because they're like, I want to be like that guy. That guy's not a fake. Mm -hmm. That guy's the real mm -hmm. thing. We live in a world today where our uh, detection for fakeness is like off the charts. Like mm -hmm. people want the real thing and we have mm -hmm. to offer them. Mm -hmm. So why not, you know, exemplify that even in our leadership? Yeah, very good. There you go. Okay, lightning round questions. This is this is fun. This is fun. Um, okay, first one. Favorite worship album of all time? 
Okay, well, I go back to the Langley Vineyard. Maybe no one's ever heard of it, but uh, there Changed was an album Brian Dirksen record. Nope, Jesus Alone, which okay. was, I think, before that. It okay. had eternity in it. Uh, I will be yours. You yeah. will be mine forever. And oh, those songs just melted me and exalt the Lord our God. Those That was the album that like floored me there was like sure. this is not like anything else i've ever heard and it was a, it was a turning point for me and when i go back to that album mm. i it's barely i don't even know if it's on spotify i think it is on spotify but it's it's so old so forming that uh it's, it's barely a cd rom <laughs> it was probably a tape and for people who like don't understand kind of the worship movement in Canada, the, the albums that came out of Langley Vineyard were so definitive, yeah. and and, and right. they made their songs made like I want to say like we learned Refiner's Fire and Good to Me and Pour Out My Heart. I feel like we learned all those Andy Park and Brian Dirksen songs long before they made it into the states, just yep. because they they were so they were everywhere they were everywhere like yeah. i remember as a kid growing up in the 80s and 90s you know you had integrity you had maranatha and then in canada you had vineyard mm -hmm. and, and some of those it's funny we're talking about vineyard canada music because there are a couple there was a record called believe that i loved when i was in, in yep. college it's not on apple music and i'm like i might have to like find a physical copy and dig out the cd player to listen do to you it. know what i had the same response and i went and found it I have the same response about that album, and I have a Brilliant. copy of it. I touched it yesterday. I should I should have brought it here. I thought about it. Cause well, don't just show it to me. Copy it and send me the files. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I, I should start like Napster, not dot net, and uh, <laughs> copy it and send you the file. Start pirating like early vineyard oh, my goodness. music. Well, I don't I love... even have a CD-ROM insert. I have nowhere to put it. <laughs> da David Ruiz out in Winnipeg, and then um, and then also the All I Need record. Um, yeah. that was huge. With He Is Yahweh, that was all college music for me. Okay. Yeah. First there album that you ever owned on any format? I think maybe Ricky Skaggs. So, okay. A do you know Ricky? Ass. I yeah. mean, it's not a worship album, but his sure. daughter, Molly Skaggs, wrote uh, that Bethel Resurrection song. What's that? Rain is not a rule as a phone. You know that one? Um, there's no, um, I don't. There ain't no grave. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And ain't no grave. Yeah. down. Yeah. She, that's Ricky Skaggs' daughter, leads that song at Bethel. No way. So uh, no way. there you go. That's Anyways, awesome. and then the other album I discovered very early on that blew my mind as far as vocal harmonies was Take Six, yeah, and it was no that doubt. album that had six vertical columns on it, one yeah. of their earliest ones. Oh man. Yeah incredible vocal harmonies so that was that <laughs> so i have to i have to hammer down then first ccm or worship album that you own oh. that you purchased <laughs> well i don't have that in my i don't know my, my notes other than I, i'm take unprepared six and, i know <laughs> i'm unprepared i can't even think back but probably it was take six okay uh just because i really like like thick jazz sure. tight vocal harmonies that one blew my mind listening to it so there you go <laughs> worship leader that's had the most impact on you okay the the names would be brian dirksen chris tomlin matt redman and cody carnes that kind of progresses through the years but these are all guys they're similar age to me i kind of identify with them they carry a guitar i like to carry a guitar so many things about what they do i feel like i just want to emulate that kind of comfort and intimacy inside a large or small environment uh, and, you know, authenticity and, and that kind of thing that we've talked about. So those are the names. Yeah. Scripture every worship leader should have memorized. <laughs> Jesus wept. How about that? Low hanging fruit. Come I on. know. I was just thinking about that, thinking, you know, don't forget Jesus had emotion. Music, worship, it's emotional. We're trying to connect to people yeah. that are going through stuff. Okay. So there's a lot more behind those two words. Just to remember, you know, we hear all this stuff. Oh, don't be so emotional in music. Or music is just trying to, like, whatever. It's like, yeah, we have emotions. God created you that way. 
and Jesus wept. Mm. So, so meet people in their place of like need and longing. See, I could go somewhere you got, beyond you got just the right, simple. You got a sermon I know. Right there, I love There's that. more than just like the shortest verse in the Bible. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm with you. Most expensive okay. musical instrument you've ever owned or played? Well, nothing dramatic, but I did buy a really nice Taylor guitar maybe five or seven years ago. But okay. it's not now my favorite one. My favorite is the Martin that my dad passed on. Mm. He passed away two years ago. Mm. He dreamed of owning a Martin, got one. He recorded a couple albums with it. I helped him do that. He's on Spotify. It's his living legacy. But I own his uh, his guitar to carry it into the next generation. And I love that one. So if people want to hear your dad's album, what's your dad's yeah, album? Vic, what's the name of the record? Vic Doll. Look him up on Spotify. It's in, in two albums, and they're they're really really great. So I love the name Vic Doll. Yep, it has it has kind of artistic appeal. Yep, he was a barber, Vic Styling Center. So that's uh, that's go. how I grew up. Yeah, <laughs> worship leader that's made you laugh the hardest. I'm wondering if it's gonna be the same answer as mine. No, no, it won't because like I don't. I, there's nobody famous that has made me laugh hardest. It's just my friend Corey Allstead. Okay. who is like my worship pastor sure. and we have a personal ongoing voice chat dialogue mm -hmm. where we just take all the covers off of our filters. Right. And we just like talk plainly to each other. And uh, it's very fun to have a dialogue, an ongoing dialogue where you can just really be raw and a bit risky. No one else is listening in it's it just reminds you that you're still human and we laugh a lot That's in that awesome. dialogue so uh and i'm glad to know he's my worship pastor so it's like i'm not just talking to some carnal person that i'm trying to uh i'm trying to like evangelize i'm actually talking to the guy that's yeah. on stage supposed to have it all together and uh, i secretly know that he doesn't so <laughs> that's great that's good Worship song that gave you goosebumps the first time you heard it? Uh, it's an Andy Park song called Yet I Will Praise. Yeah. I Have you ever that heard that one? Yeah. When Even I heard that when... one. Yeah yeah. 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 I heard that song when I was going through probably the lowest season of my life. Uh, my, my marriage was like crumbling. I was just, and I was you know, having to be on stage leading worship while mm. just trying to keep my family together. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that song was like, I got shivers when I, when I heard it. So yeah. Andy's the guy who mentored Brian Dirksen. He right. was like the real core founding. He was yeah. John Wimber's vineyard worship yeah. leader back in the day. So, uh, he wrote some great songs. That was one that's really moved me. And just to bring it full circle, I think that's on the Believe album that you're going to rip yeah. to MP3 and send. I know. WeTransfer.com. Okay. Let's I'm, go. I am going to. Okay. <laughs> um, a newer worship artist that we may not have heard yet but need to. All right. Uh, Sky Peterson. Have you ever heard of her? Sky Peter. Man, I'm willing to listen to anybody. With okay. The first name there Sky. you go. That's Nobody great. would have heard of it. I just interviewed Keith Getty. A couple of days ago, you can you can see it on Praise Charts. We talk okay. about Sky. Sky is Andrew Peterson's daughter. Andrew Peterson yes. wrote. Yeah. You know what's his yep. big song? Um, um, uh, the the one. Um, oh, uh, <laughs> hold on, hold on. Is he Somebody, worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Now we have brought the world together. So Andrew Peterson, is he worthy? His daughter, twenty years old, is now one of the ten. Um, sanctioned hymn writers of the Getty team. And she's got three songs right now in praise charts. Two of them are trending, like in the top 10, uh, that she had a hand in writing. So that's why I was like, I, no I'm one's heard of her. I'm you need to, to go know, to praise charts. I'm interested yeah. to know about this whole sanction thing with Keith Getty. Does he does he knight the, the songwriters? Do they have to get yeah. down on one knee? Like, <laughs> what's, what's going on here? I don't the, know. The, the, the but, holy you know. in Christ alone water. For a no, yeah. <laughs> but Keith is a guy. I mean, he has been around as well, been around the block. And he is not just about writing songs by himself. Now he's trying to raise up modern yeah. hymn writers for 
he he wants to train people and to develop a, a community of people who will write songs that we'll be singing in 30 years. Yeah, and him and Matt so, Boswell kind of lead that movement. Yep, and Matt in, Papa. And Matt, Matt Papa. Papa as well. Well, and the great thing about writing strophic style hymns is that you are agreeing to a cadence and agreeing to a format that forces you to make every single word count when you're writing yeah. a lyric. Yeah. You know, syllables matter. We've kind of gotten away from that, you know, um, but I, I definitely have a great appreciation for that. Okay, current yep. best selling worship artists or songs on praisecharts.com okay well praise charts is full of song lists on any theme any topic any year anything you want you can go so i literally like went in just to see that the you know the top songs that have been selling in 2022 so this is very current and it would all kind of come down to keith getty's got lots of great songs that okay. are, are still going strong phil wickham has been massive Charity Gale has been uniquely yeah. very, she is big, but in praise charts tends to appeal to a, a very like vocal driven choir band gospel. She's got all the chops to pull that together. And her song, uh, thank you Jesus for the blood has been massive this last yeah. year. Yeah. So of course, Bethel Brooke Ligger, Ligger would, uh, amidst all of the drama of Hillsong, she's still been able to sort of like, uh, find a way through sure. and offer up songs like, you know, A Thousand Hallelujahs is just an awesome song. Who, who Which was co-written with Phil Wickham. Like, if yeah. you can't get into a oh, room and write a song with the two of them, like, I know, <laughs> I don't yep. know you got problems. <laughs> and, uh, of course, Chris Tomlin. Chris Tomlin kind of went, I feel like he went through this season where he was trying out some other things. He did try country. His yeah, last album... His last album, uh, this is what I've heard anyways, is he is decidedly trying to come back to oh, yeah. like more mainstream worship. There's a song, and hit, there's a song on there called For, uh, Forever Holy. Um, yeah, Holy Forever. Yeah. Sorry, I got it mixed yeah. up. Um, that he co-wrote with, uh, again, Brian and Jen Johnson. And, and yeah. Bill Wickham, I think, is on it as well. But the first time I heard that, I'm just like, yes, yes. Yeah. I want to say that to the Lord. Yes, yes, yes. That There's mm -hmm. something there. So, you know, the song from that album that struck me, though, uh -huh. and I'm singing it next week a couple of times, is just his version of Oh, Lord, You're Beautiful. Let's I was go, like, OK, Green. now Old you school. are connecting to yeah. a place where I have walked through and he made that song feel like it was brand new again. So if you haven't heard his version of that and certainly in praise charts, it's been like probably the number one song from his latest album is oh lord you're beautiful like, i was sitting with my oh, senior pastor we went out for lunch the other day and he started quoting me keith green lyrics my eyes are dry and, and oh yeah I, i'm just like you are like this is just a wonderful connecting moment right now because keith yeah. green is just like That's right. you talk to any really great pastor because keith green's music was so prophetic any great teacher mm -hmm. in the church many of them that are like in their 50s now they were influenced by keith mm -hmm. green because mm -hmm. As much as there was a musical gift there, there was a prophetic teaching gift in his music as well. Yep. But and it, it lasted. Kind of like he's like a bit of a like a Rich Mullins, you know, someone yeah. that just died too early. Sure. And uh, and we're still singing his stuff. So yeah. so Rich Mullins, I should have put him in a list of like people that have influenced me step by step. Though that's a song oh my definitely gosh. that the was the honesty uh, of that the honesty yeah. of that lyric sometimes yeah. the climb can be so hard. Oh God, you are my God and I will yeah. pray. That's right. Yeah, I, I we sung that of course because that song in the nineties kind of made its way in just as the chorus and then he later wrote verses to it and re recorded yeah. it. And I remember listening to the verses and I'm like, oh, oh, this is rich. This is like no, yeah. it's not it is rich, but it's also rich in lyric. It was it I was know. so good. Yeah. Yeah. That's I great. don't even think I know. I don't. I don't even know the verse, but the the song, the chorus, was yeah. a theme to my wedding. So it was no like way. a really big song. You for have us. to. Yeah. Okay, so the project was, I think, uh, "Wind of Heaven, Stuff of Earth." You got to listen to the verses. It's all okay. about. It's all about struggle, and it and the chorus brings everything together. And yeah, uh, one of the lyrics is uh, he talks about he uses this imagery and says, uh, "Sometimes I feel like Abraham, and I look up at the stars, knowing that one was lit for me." And I'm like, mm. wow, what a great, because mm. we are Crazy. the descendants, right? Like, yeah. What a great, great, great image. Okay, yeah. last last question. Okay. The most important character 
trait that every worship leader should foster in their hearts. <laughs> okay, well, this is kind of, this is what I would aspire towards anyways. Two words, playful humility. That's yeah. what I try to go after. So I don't want to be like so humble that's like, oh, he barely says anything, you know, we barely notice him because he's just so meek. Yeah. Um, I have this kind of playful side to me. It's a bit of a nerdy, geeky. I don't quite care what people think. I say awkward things. I try to make people laugh. I don't know. I just feel like I want to have that and also that sort of authentic, real, humble kind of person. And it's it's hard to say, oh, I am so humble. You know, even saying that is part of the playful side of me saying you can't declare that you're humble because as soon as you do, you're not. But True. I can aspire towards it. And um, But I think playfulness is something that maybe we don't elevate enough. Like people, can we just, can we just chill a bit? Can we yeah. just not hey, take ourselves quite so serious? I'm with you. You know what? Oh. I got a Gloria Gaither quote for you. You ready for this? All right. Gloria yeah. Gaither said, um, Try not to take yourself so seriously, but do take God very seriously. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. those are words to live by. Those are yeah. words to live by. Like, let's have yeah. fun. Let's have fun. Yeah. That's Man, awesome. Ryan Dahl, praisecharts.com. It has been incredible just to catch up with you. Um, thank you so much for your time and for being a part of this. And yeah. Uh, yeah, if you're listening, make sure you get all of your resources uh, to lead your <laughs> team at praisecharts.com. Com. Thank you, Ryan. You it's go. been great. Super fun. Thank you for having me, Travis.